Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the second year we try to do this series, and that is uh, we have uh, local faculty. We introduce research of the people who just got a Nobel Prize this year. I see we did it, and I think uh, pretty successful, so we continue. And uh, so first one will be by Kao today, and then we will have one on the physics prize, and we have one on chemistry prize, and we have a talk on the economics prize. And uh, so at least we get know what people have done, at least at some certain level, and know why they get a prize, and then there's some controversial issues why they should not get, or some people think that's the case in one of the prizes. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to introduce Carl since I know most of you are life scientists who know him better than me. So, so I just uh, let's just welcome Carl. So thank you very much. Actually, I, I want to thank everybody um, for many reasons. Um, I didn't actually know a lot about this topic uh, after I was asked to, uh, to speak on it, but I am a, <clears throat> I'm a card-carrying neuroscientist, which means I was one of the people most, uh, who should most obviously give this talk. So the first thing I want to do is to, to uh, thank Henry for the opportunity to actually delve into a literature which is beautiful. I mean, I actually had a very enjoyable time doing that. Um, I want to obviously thank all of you for coming. and. Uh, taking out a, um, an hour of your day. And I want to thank uh, Tony Chan because as the president of the university, he actually uh, had this beautiful graphic in one of his presentations. And I liked it so much, I asked him if I could steal it. Um, and he said yes. All right, so today um, I'm going to try and talk to you about the uh, 2014 uh, Oh, the other thing I wanted to say was it's been great being able to tell my children that I'm giving a Nobel lecture. <laughs> it's a real benefit of this. Anyway, so the, the, uh, I'm here to talk today about the 2014 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. It was shared by this gentleman here, John O'Keefe, uh, from University College London. He got half the prize. And then the other half of the prize went to these uh, two individuals, um, May Britt and Edvard Moser. <clears throat> Through the miracle of modern technology, you'll actually hear from May Britt later. They won the other half of the prize. Um, and the Nobel Committee announced that the prize was for their discoveries of cells that constitute a positioning system in the brain. And that's a direct quote from their press release. So <clears throat> how to describe this? The first thing we're going to have to do, unfortunately, is we have to go and bring you up to speed with some of the neurobiology behind this uh, discovery. Why it's, and because, and I'll, I'll make it as painless as I can, but it's really important to have that background before you can go ahead and, and, uh, and understand and really appreciate uh, what it was that O'Keefe and the Mosers were able to do. So this is my five minute course in neuroscience. Um, all right, ready? OK, here we go. So this is a somewhat typical neuron. Um, and to distill it to its essence, it's got a part where information comes in. That's called the dendrite. And here, all the information is carried around just as a, a spread of current. <laughs> Robert. Um, there is a go-no-go -no -go decision point right here, which is called the axon hillock. And then there is the place that the information leaves, which is called the axon. So the information is basically flowing in one direction from the dendrite through the axon hillock and out the axon. Neurons transmit this information and move information from one place in the brain to the other and also from the brain to your body uh, using electrical signals. And the signals are generated both within cells and between cells. And it's actually a, 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 a wonderful evolutionary achievement that neurons are able to create electricity and use it productively to move information. 
The signals that are created are actually millivolts in size, which means that even with rather crude measuring technologies, you can detect them. And so I've noticed that there are some um, students here from my biology 1902 class, and I was going to call on one of them to come up and give this section of the talk. OK, failing to see volunteers. Um, the way in which the, the uh, uh, neuron generates electricity is it creates a potential across its membrane. So by building around itself a fatty membrane, you create essentially an insulation. And then you put pumps in the membrane that pump sodium out and potassium in. And by virtue of doing that, you make the outside of the cell electrically positive with respect to the inside. That creates a potential. And that potential is minus 65 millivolts inside. So it's, it's, it's low on the inside, high on the outside. <clears throat> and this is a diagram taken from an axon where information is going to travel. Now this is a bit complicated, and yet it's at some level, if you're really going to understand the, the prize, you need to understand how these uh, uh, signals are transmitted from one place to another. Um, so here is how an action potential is generated. So here's the cell. This hap cell happens to be sitting at minus 60 millivolts. And at some point, and we won't discuss how, a disturbance is created which allows sodium channels to open. So then sodium rushes inside down both its electrical gradient, because it's negative inside, and its chemical gradient, because sodium is high outside. What that does is it creates a, a local disturbance where it's positive inside, and that depolarizes the axon up to the sodium's equilibrium potential. And then, through the magic of a second channel known as a potassium channel, this channel closes, this one opens, and now potassium, which is positive on the inside, rushes outside. And that repolarizes the membrane back to the resting potential. So resting potential, a depolarization event, and then a repolarization. That's the essence of an action potential. And without going into all the, all the details, the key about this is that this positivity will actually stimulate sodium channels further down to open. And so this wave of depolarization will spread all the way down the axon and it does so undiminished, so that the strength of the action potential at the beginning of the axon is exactly the same as the strength of the action potential at the end of the axon. And if you set a threshold on your amplifier, you can, with a loudspeaker, hear a pop when it gets over, say, plus 10 millivolts. Or if you put a light on it, you can see an LED and a little flash when an action potential, or as it's called in neuroscience, an event happens. So each event, each pop, and you're going to hear some pops in a moment. So each one of them represents a single depolarization, a single packet of information traveling from the cell body down the axon to its end. There's one more thing you need to know. So everything I've talked about so far was with an electrode inside the cell and a reference electrode outside the cell. But that's not really practical in a brain. So a brain is like mush. Um, and to try and get in with a sharp electrode and get inside a cell, it's possible. And many electrophysiologists have done it. But the much easier way to go is to, instead of going inside the, So we've been talking about an electrode like this, which is inside the cell relative to an outside. But you can also come very close to the axon on the outside of the cell, where if you will remember, the outside is positive. And now, when a disturbance comes through, instead of a depolarization, which makes it more positive, on the outside of the cell, it actually becomes transiently more negative. And you can record that in exactly the same way. This is called an extracellular recording. And this is how all the recordings we're going to see today were actually done. OK. So. Nothing ever exists in isolation in science. So the work of the Mosers and of John O'Keefe builds on a 
a fundamental observation in neuroscience, the groundwork of which was laid by these two gentlemen here, David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel. Um, they shared a, a Nobel Prize uh, already, wow, long time ago, um, for physiology or medicine. And their prize was based on working out the neurophysiology of the visual system of the cat. And here is their seminal paper that was cited by the Nobel Committee. It was written in 1959, and it's, um, it actually still stands as, a, as one of those classics in, in science that uh, is, is worth reading. And, and what, what Hubel and Wiesel did was something uh, clever. They, they did this extracellular recording like I showed you. They get really close to a, a, a unit in, in the brain. And then they said, okay, how, and this is in the, in the cat brain. So they're in the, uh, you know, very far removed from the retina, which is where the light information is coming in. And they, they found this unit. And if they just shined a light on the whole visual field, nothing happened. But if they shined a light in the very center of the field, they saw that the cell would pop, 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 pop these little events. But as soon as they turned the light on, it went silent. And then as soon as they turned it off, there was a and then it, it went on. If they did it here, the light was right here. And they turned it on, it went off. And then when they turned it off, it went on. In the end, they reconstructed what they called the visual field of this cell. And that is diagrammed here, where this A is right here in the center. And they discovered that it was a, a bar of the visual field, which would essentially here, here, and here. And this type of cell they called an off-center on surround, simply saying, that you could describe the visual field. This cell was looking at an area like this, and if, it was, if the light came on in it, it was off, but otherwise it was on. And this was remarkable for its day because what it said, as they reconstructed the cat visual system, they realized that just as um, the retina contained, the retina is like the back of a camera, it contains a, a, literally a point-to-point -point representation of your visual field. So something over there is on this side of my retina. That two-dimensional reconstruction is reflected perfectly into cortex, and it does so by this mechanism. And where they were recording in primary visual cortex, which is called area 17, it's in the back of your brain about here, um, it reproduces that field even though it, it's, it's actually two synapses on the way. And that the cells fired in response to light in very specific places in the visual field. And of course that was only the start of what they did. They then got to uh, and realized that the further you moved into association cortex, that is to say, as you left primary visual cortex, because that's area 17, area 17 talks to area 18. Area 18 talks to other areas in association cortex where the richness of, vi of the visual information gets more and more and more detailed. They discovered that the, the cells had increasingly complex properties. So the cell that I showed you was just a, a, a basically a simple cell, even though if you think about it, it's actually fairly complicated to be on but no to shut off when the, the light comes, comes on. But that was a position cell. There are also cells that are responsive to orientation. And if you think about it, that cell was also responsive to orientation because its off, its off center was in a vertical meridian along that center spot of light. As you move further up into area 18, now you see not only uh, uh, a position, not so much, but now you see orientation, you see motion and direction. So now a cell will only respond if that bar is moving. And it will only respond sometimes if it's moving in a particular direction, you know, for, uh, your right to left. Other cells will respond no matter which way it's moving. And then, so those are called complex cells. And then there are hypercomplex cells. 
which are responsive not just to orientation, motion, and direction, but also to the length of the light bar or dark bar that's moving across the field. And the point of all this, and, and again, now we're moving from area 18 into area 19, a, a more advanced area of the visual uh, system. But the point of all this is that increasingly as you move into cortex, which is where all of our think, what we call thinking goes on, as the further you move into cortex, the more sophisticated and complex the transformation is of the fundamental sensory information. So the first step in that process is to translate light into electrical energy. That happens in your retina. But then as you move backwards, that light information is transmitted not just as light, but as position, as direction, as orientation, as motion. And each of these computations is done at a higher and higher level of the cortex. OK. So that's neurobiology in five minutes. Now, I'm really sorry. We need to do another course in five minutes. And that is, a, I need to tell you about the anatomy of the brain, or at least the relevant parts of the anatomy of the brain. And I, I'm going to try and do it in five minutes. OK. So. If I'm going to do the brain in five minutes, it's a fist. This is your brain. This is your left brain. Your, most of your neocortex is my fingers, but your temporal lobe is my thumb. And it's that thumb that we're going to worry about today. So the brain is the fist, and here's the temporal lobe down here. This little structure has all sorts of interesting things in it. So your speech area is right here. Memory, as we're going to see, is deep inside. Um, auditory, your hearing information, is also here. It's a really interesting part of your brain. Actually, all of the brain is interesting, but this part is really interesting. OK, so here's a real brain come out of a real person. And you can see it's, it, it, a little bit of the covering is taken away here. But here's the front of the brain. Here's the back. and. Now, it's going to look just like that drawing of a brain, but we're, we're going to take a slice right here, and then we're going to look at it this way, and this is what it looks like. So here's the thumb, and here's the fist. Here's the midline, here's the other fat, and here's your other thumb. OK. So that's the temporal lobe, and the part we're interested in is right here. So that little, little thing which the early neuroanatomists of vivid imagination saw as a seahorse, um, the, the, um, the little sea creature, um, they called that the hippocampus. And that's the structure, of the, 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 the part of the brain that, we're, that the Mosers and the O'Keefe spent a lot of time on. So here is that brain inside a skull. Uh, it's the, here's the thumb. And what's diagrammed in red here is that hippocampus. So this part oops, here, as you can see, forms this long structure with a tail at the end. And it, 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 um, it's, it's actually quite complex in three dimensions. And for medical students who have to dissect brains and, and trace it, it, it drives them crazy trying to reconstruct it. Um, this is a, what it looks like in a monkey brain. So here's the fist, here's the thumb, and here is the hippocampus. OK. Now, the Mosers and O'Keeffe's, they're no dummies. They said, this is too complicated to work with. It's all well and good that Hubel and Weasel work with cats. Cats are too complicated. We're going to work with the rat. So the rat has no folds in the brain. It's, it's a smooth brain in its cortex. And look how simple its hippocampus is. It's just this part here. And that whole thumb is just this little part right here. So the anatomy is simpler, and yet it's still pretty complicated. And we're going to talk about the circuitry that, without going into too much of the details, we're interested in this layer, this single layer of cells here, the CA fields, as they're called, a single layer of cells. And we're interested in these cells here 
which are the entorhinal cortex. And we're interested in these because this structure is where we've known for a long time you store memory. And one of the ways, and we, we know this for many, many reasons, but mostly we know it because people got hurt in accidents and that part of their brain was damaged. When that part of their brain was damaged on both sides, you end up not being able to remember anything longer than a few minutes. So you could remember what I just said, but you can't remember what I said two minutes ago. And that's what happens if you bilaterally damage the hippocampus. OK, so now we can finally get to the Nobel Prize. So it, OK, that, enough of the anatomy, enough of the neurobiology. Let's talk about the prize itself. And we're going to do a thought experiment. So here's the experiment. I want you to imagine that it's nighttime because I can't have lights anywhere. And now I want you to imagine that there is a colossal power failure. OK? Now, and you can achieve the same thing if you'd like by just closing your eyes for a moment. And ask yourself, where's the door? Now, you know where it is. You could point to it. And in fact, if I ask you to walk to it, you would get pretty close. You would, you know, maybe stumble a little bit. But in the, the point is, in the total darkness, without any visual cues at all, you will remember where the door is, and you will be able to find it. And so the question is, how? How did you store that information? How is it possible that in the complete absence of visual cues, you are able to walk fairly efficiently from where you are to another place in your world? And so the answer to that question is what won these three individuals a Nobel Prize. So the work started with an extraordinarily surprising publication uh, in 1971, and here's John O'Keefe um, at the MRC at the University College London. Um, and as you can see, hippocampus is a spatial map. I read the paper and I was really, I had to just sit back and smile. Because in this entire paper, there were only 76 recordings. Only eight of the 76 were of interest and are the focus of the entire paper. The entire article is five pages long. This is the only figure, and it won a Nobel Prize. <laughs> I'm thinking, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> but this is actually the essence of what O'Keefe found, which, OK, now uh, I'll show you what this is in a minute. But basically, he put. As a, as a permanent installation in the mouse brain, a set of electrodes. So technically, that's actually quite difficult. So we had to cement a harness to the rat's head. And through that harness, he had to insert microelectrodes that could be very finely graded in position. Because you'll see in a minute, we need to get depth right. We obviously need to get our xy coordinates right. and after putting that on surgically, the electrodes have to remain patent, meaning they have to be able to function, and the rat has to be able to move around freely. That's a pretty tall order. But he was able to do that. That's why there are only 76 recordings, by the way. He was able to do that. And what he found was that when he held the rat in this position, this cell fired like crazy. When he moved it just slightly, it fired a little less. And as soon as he went, even moving from C to D, it shut off completely. Nothing in E, even though it's the rat was in almost the same place in the box. Nothing in F, nothing in G. H, a little bit, and then right back to A, and it started firing again. And from evidence, no more evidence than this. Remember, he's only looking at 8 of 76 recordings. He was able to say that the rat must, these cells, must somehow know where the rat is in that box. So the rat has constructed a spatial map of its environment. Now, I, liked, I saw this and it also made me smile because 
we all know this these days, but we would never say this in any of our paper, that figure one is the clearest example. We would just say, this is the way it is, and let people assume that we had 400 cells that look just like that. All right, now I know we're going to do a little e-learning, and through the miracle of modern technology, I am going to bring you one of the Nobel laureates, Mary Britt Moser, who is going to show you what John O'Keefe saw with a more modern uh, rig. So, all right, so remember those action potentials that I showed you. Each one of those events, and she's outside the cell, so they're going to be, you know, negative uh, events, is going to elicit a pop in an amplifier. And each of those pops is going to then cause the computer to put a dot at the location where the rat's head was when the event happened. And what you need to sort of get your head around is that she's doing these events, these electrical events, from a single cell. Okay, so, and I'll let her describe the rest. I hope. And you also have to see that the rat is just concentrated on fine. Oh, don't don't die. <laughs> Please don't die. Finding chocolate. Thank you. Let's see if we can get the movie to. So you see how hard it is to get the harness established. So here you listen to this one cell in the hippocampus. And the red dots, that's the action potential of this cell. And you see the rat is doing exactly the same thing when he's here and when he's there. But the cell knows exactly when the animal is up there and when it's down here, because here it's silent. And here we see the path of the animal, the white trace. And the red dots, that's the activity of this cell. Okay. Thank you, Mary Britt. We'll have you back in just a moment. Okay. So, these cells are in those CA fields, that single layer of cells, in particular, a subdivision called CA1, CA3, unimportant, but it's in this area called the hippocampus. What's fascinating about this, and, and O'Keefe went on to discover this, is that these patterns develop very quickly when the animal is put into a new environment. So let's say you take a rat and you put him in a box that he's never been in before. Very quickly, within just a few minutes, the hippocampus has settled on a firing pattern such that there are place cells firing in very specific locations, and, and the rat remembers that environment. So then if you take the rat out, put him in his home cage, bring him back later, and put him in that same environment, the same place cells fire in the same locations. And I'll show you some evidence for that in a moment. But here's some typical place cells. Um, and this is, this is from a review in the Trends in Neuroscience, actually just, just this year. Uh, so the, it, it's, a, it's a pattern, it's a stable pattern, it, it will, um, and the, one of the more remarkable things that I learned in, in, in diving into this literature is that virtually all the cells in the hippocampus, an estimated 90% of them, are able to function as place cells. Um, but in any one world, that is in any one environment, only a fraction of them are functioning that way. And so that goes back to O'Keefe's original experiment where only eight of his 76 units were what he called interesting. And, and, and yet, unlike the visual system where I said you have a, a spatial topic map, that is your retina is reproduced in, in your, on the back of your occipital cortex, in the world of the hippocampus, there's no spatial topic representation. So there's no predicting the location of a place cell for here. So I can't tell you where that place cell is in my hippocampus, but there will be one that fires that way. Then you start doing really interesting things. So suppose you put the rat in an environment and now you move the boundary and you double the environment, but all you've done is like take down this wall. 
the play cell responds, which emphasizes that in part the rat is using the cues, but in also in part it's using the boundary. It, it's doing a, uh, some sort of transformation that allows it to map its whole environment regularly on, on, in, its, in its real world. And the importance of boundaries is actually most interesting if you put a new boundary into the world. So here is the original field of a place cell. You put in a new boundary and now suddenly that cell is firing in two locations and you can see the, the, the homology between this position for the boundary and this one. So certain distance from both walls and near to this wall. Okay, so O'Keefe in the end concluded that the hippocampus generates numerous maps but that and that each map represents the summed activity of all the place cells at that time. And it is the unique combination of these place cells that allows the animal to know where he is. It is the answer to the thought experiment of how you know you can find the door even if the lights are out. Because you have cells in your hippocampus that are going to fire as you make the move each way. But that's all well and good. But so far, it's nothing but magic because the hippocampus is not sensory cortex. So what do I mean by that? It is not getting visual information from anywhere obvious. There's no connection to our visual system. Frankly, there's no connection to our auditory system. There's, the only connection that's even remotely direct would be from our sense of smell. Um, and that's a whole other lecture which we won't go into. So vision is probably the key, but the question is where does the information come from? So now this is where the Mosers come in because they worked with John O'Keefe and then they went off to Norway, or I guess they went back to Norway because they're both Norwegian and they'd grown up there. Um, and by the way, this is an example of why we know vision is important because if in the rat's world there's a curtain over here and he's using that to orient himself and all the other cues are the same. If you move the curtain over here, now the place cell fires in, the, in this. So it isn't like he's, it's not a GPS device. He is using visual information to create the map, to know where his world is. Okay, so we're going back to the hippocampus. You've seen this diagram before, or this image before. And now the Mosers asked, okay, the main input to hippocampus. So all of, all of O'Keefe's place cells are right here in this area of the hippocampus. So the Mosers said, all right, where is the information coming from? Well, most of the information has got to be coming from entorhinal cortex, and that's here. So here is the diagram of the CA fields. This little arrowhead here is this pink thing. And then you get into, this is called archicortex because it's ancient cortex. And then you finally get into the modern six-layer cortex, which is neocortex, and that's what's happening here. And for the spatially challenged among you, I'll flip the diagram around. Here's the, here's the, this is the pink, this is the yellow. Here's where the information is coming from. So the Mosers looked in entorhinal cortex, asking, are there place cells in entorhinal cortex? Because the, you know, how, how are the, how are the cells in the hippocampus making that connection? How are they, what is the process they're using? And what they found there was a new type of cell they called a grid cell. Now they had to do a little more work. They actually had to look at 220 cells in 14 rats. Um, and basically what they said was that they discovered a single cell, which is now not firing at a given place, but rather defining a lattice. And I will, if I could call Mary back up, Mary Britt, we will have her explain this to you in the clearest possible terms. Uh -huh. All right, take it away, Mary. The part of the middle and rhinal cortex, because that is the area that is projecting to the dorsal hippocampus where John O'Keefe discovered the place cells. And if we then uh, play the movie again with the rat running around, doing like the rat with the hippocampal recordings, just chasing chocolate, we can ask, how does this cell react it. when the animal is uh, running around in the environment? So now there is no sound, they are just 
white dots where the animal, no, where the cell is firing. And you see that the rat is running, running, and running. But already now, you see that it's quite messy, the activity. So maybe there is not good spatial uh, um, information in the entorhinal cortex. But if you have a happy animal, you get good coverage of the environment. And if we have this good coverage that we will have in a while, we just speed up the movie a bit, you start to Amazing. see a pattern. So it looks like there's one hippocampal place field here, another hippocampal place field here, and so on. But this is in cortex, and it's one cell, and you see that the activity is distributed throughout this environment. Pretty amazing. So those are what she defined and what they defined as grid cells because they are defining a grid. And here is an example. So it, it's a trace like you just saw uh, from the dorsal, uh, from the medial entorhinal cortex. So that's up on the side, but still in the side in entorhinal cortex. Um, and this is the science paper just 10 years ago uh, that really announced to the world that this is what was there. Uh, the lattice is triangular. You can almost see that without, uh, um, and that they're very numerous in the upper layers of entorhinal cortex. So cortex is not only in two dimensions of the, of the, uh, the surface of the brain, there's also a third dimension, which is how deep you go, and it's, it's highly organized in all three dimensions. So here's an example of what they found. In, this is how they know where they were. So you can see where the electrode came into the brain. It actually does damage. And then they can put a little dot. It isn't actually a red dot. It's a little electrical lesion to let them know where they were when they were recording. And so as they go into the brain, they find different grid cells. And you can see the grid is, this is uh, six different cells. The grid is different for each one. Um, but what's interesting is if they go away and come back the next day, the grid is the same. So this is that, this is that, this is it. And you can see that for each one of them. So they maintain, just like the place cells, from day to day they actually maintain a, uh, their grid coordinates um, and, and, um, and yet in any one cell, it's not, uh, uh, the, the, the cell is not the same as its neighbor. So you can't predict what this cell is going to look like based on what that cell looked like. So then they made a remarkable um, leap. And I have to say, this was a tremendous leap of faith. It, in, but, you know, good intuition is important in science, and they showed, they showed this. They realized that the deeper they went, so this is, this is the top of the rat brain and this is the bottom. So as they went deeper in entorhinal cortex, they saw that the fields started to look like this. Now, if you or I saw that, we might be tended to say, well, it's just falling apart. But the Moser said, no, what's going on is that the grid is expanding. So that the lower you go in entorhinal cortex, the wider the spacing in the real world between the, uh, the, the points of the grid. And if you really want to see a leap of faith, when they got down to the most ventral parts of the medial entorhinal cortex, they saw this and they said, oh, well, that must mean that the pattern is spaced out over great distances. I don't know who reviewed this paper, but I did sent them back to the drawing board at this point. Nonetheless, they, of course, they turned out to be right. But really, I wasn't convinced until I read this paper. And actually, I stole this from a, an online lecture that, uh, that Edvard gave. Um, they had to build an 18-meter track because they couldn't devise a recording system that would allow them a rat to have free motion across the size of what they thought the grid was. So they devised a, a one-dimensional a, a one track and said, if the grid cell spacing is really the way we think, then across 18 meters, we ought to be able to see peaks where the grid is trying to put up its, its vertices. 
And that turned out to be exactly true. So here's that 18 meters, and here are the cell, the firing pattern of the red cell as the rat goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's doing it in one dimension. And here's a particularly favorable cell, but now instead of being spaced just a, a few centimeters apart, or tens of centimeters apart, it's spaced, you know, meters apart. And here's a blue cell, and here's the, here's the, uh, the average of that. So this grid is at different scales at different parts of entorhinal cortex. So I want to wrap up. I mean, obviously, there's, there's a lot more to this. It's a very, very rich literature. And I think what's even more compelling is that there is so much left to explore. There is so much that we don't know about this system. And, but let me just sum up with what the Moser said. So they concluded that the grid cells are these place-modulated neurons in this triangular array. They drew the analogy to Hubel and Weasel, and they, and they are very generous in their uh, acknowledgement that that is the conceptual foundation on which they are standing. Um, and that they think that now, though, this is not sensory anymore. This is a model for how we as human beings have subjective experiences. In other words, how we think about our world how we reconstruct our world. That's different from how we perceive our world. In other words, if I see a red light, I can tell it from a green light. But what makes me stop when I see the red light? That's a subjective experience. And what the Mosers are saying is that th these, these grid cells and place cells are really the first insight into how the brain begins to take specific sensory inputs and make a subjective experience out of it. And this, I think, is incredibly true, which is that these are insights into the algorithms of how the entire cortex encodes information and processes it. So these are the simple conclusions. These, the principal cells of the hippocampus can, uh, and mostly do, function as place cells. Most of the cells, though not all, in the entorhinal cortex, again, can function as grid cells. And what that means is that most of the archicortex, this old cortex, is essentially functioning in our brains as, at least one of its functions, is to function as a GPS device to let us know where we are in our world. So I just made a list of questions that I still had. Um, I, this is actually hotly debated in the field right now. Do the place cells specify the grid cells, or did the grid cells specify the place cells? In other words, now, the Mosers claim the place cells mature first, which is to say the first, when you, if you go during development, the young rats first have place cell firings with not, but not a very mature grid cell system, and that's fairly compelling in my world. Um, but it's hotly debated as to who specifies whom. We still don't know how the visual information gets there. I mean, there is, even in entorhinal cortex, there's no obvious connection to visual information. So how does the entorhinal cortex know what's going on in our world, and how is that information transferred? Um, I was thinking about what happens in a bat. Is there a third dimension to the place cells? Um, most of our experience is, in fact, two-dimensional, but we do have a third dimension. like. You could get to the door even though you have to walk down the stairs. And that's a third dimension. Um, of course, as my students in 1902 will know, I think evolution is the most, uh, nothing in biology makes sense without it. I want to know how these place and grid cells evolved. They come from a, a hippocampus, which only is, is in fact a structure that's in, in mammals, in, uh, in, and so in much more evolved brains. And yet the early prehippocampus called the pallium is present in all vertebrates. And my bet is that there's some really interesting comparative biology to do there. The other question is, since I work in Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's disease essentially destroys the hippocampus. So we know that it destroys memory. And actually, if you have an, someone with Alzheimer's disease, you know that at the later stages of the disease, one of the, one of the symptoms is they have what's called wandering, which is They'll leave the house and end up in a completely different neighborhood without any idea of where they are. But 
when we think of memory, we think of, you know, um, can I remember, um, you know, the facts for Professor Harrop's test, which is coming up in a couple weeks. Um, what does that have to do with place? And yet I just told you that most of the cells in our hippocampus are devoted to place. But mostly I want to thank all of you for the opportunity to get into this literature. It was a great weekend reading about all this and congratulations to what I think is an extraordinarily well-deserved prize for a very interesting body of literature. So I will try to answer any questions, but I didn't do this work. Uh, I'm not, not sure I can handle all of them. But anyways, thank you all. So I'm supposed to uh, introduce you. There's something wrong with my hippocampal cells. Uh, <laughs> to the memory. I, I hope I'm able to get here in five minutes from my office. So nothing wrong with the big set. Okay. So any question for our speaker today? I own your big apology. Okay. <laughs> so when you say cell, are you referring to the unit of life cell or a regional locale? Um, in, the, in the neuroscience business, when you're measuring events, it's one cell. But as, as I, that's why I showed you the recording, we're recording from outside, so there is always the possibility that there are additional cells involved. Basically, that neuroscience has been done. It's probably one cell, literally one neuron. Thank you. So, uh, oh, paper, paper you showed the first time about the cat. Again? The paper you showed the, about the cat's brain, Joan O'Keefe paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you had a few visuals, right? In the last one where the light was shown over the full visual field, right. there, were no, there was no response. Right. But if you look at the, like, you look at the paper they published, it, the light was there on the band itself, right? But right. yet there was no response. Right. A bit Why that. is that? Yeah. Because if the light's on the whole visual field, it's on the off-center, but it is also on the on-surround, and so they cancel. So the, the surround is telling the cell, fire, but the center is telling the cell, don't fire, and the cell throws up its hands and says, I quit. Here. So my question is, in the grid cell, you were talking about they are uh, arranged mm -hmm. in a triangular way. Mm -hmm. This is a very sort of, a, in, chemi in, in physics, if you pack a ball in a, a plan, you will get this uh, six-fold symmetry. I saw that it's a really nice it is. of a crystal type thing. And is it this symmetry reflects some, uh, it's, arrangement of cells in the bike in the place or just trying to know how that symmetry developed I I don't know uh, it, it's a really good question there are a lot of features of this that are um, interesting that's one of them the other is these I mean I, I made it seem like it's a smooth the the spacing of the of the peaks of, of the of the grid spacing um, they believe it's actually discontinuous rather than a smooth gradation on the way down. So that there are areas that are close grid, areas that are a little bit further, and areas that are much further. And how, whether that spacing is triangular, we don't know. Uh, that, I mean, the Mosers make a joke about it because it, it's actually technically very hard to do the record. You saw how the rat had the, had the wires to its head. You, you imagine trying to engineer that in a room that's 18 meters by 18 meters. That would be extraordinarily difficult. And, and you're trying to pick up, you know, 50 millivolts as a, as a response. So I don't know. I, that I don't know. Thank you. Um, I, I, I think it's a little bit related to the memory. Pres presumably, uh, um, the, the rat is put in the box, taken out of the box, put back in the box, and still knows where it is. Mm -hmm. 
but life is full of boxes, uh, some of which we never go back to. So uh, do we, 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 we f these place cells and grid cells, they forget, and, and, and then in a new environment, they relearn. Is anything about that understood? Um, okay, so having, uh, over the course of the days that I've been trying to do the reading, I think that's one of the questions that we don't know. We know that it will eventually extinguish. We know that if you move the rat from one environment to another, the map switches very quickly and will just, you'll flip over into a new map, which will have no relationship to the map it just established. But if you bring it back to the first environment, it'll reestablish the first map. How long it will remember, uh, I don't think that's been, I, I didn't find anything that, that asked the question in quite that way. It sounds like it, but a week is not a problem. And whether it can go a month, I don't know. How on this uh, grid cell, that, uh, so how does this, this, this mouse uh, measure distance? I mean, presumably, you know, in 18 meter thing, we come out and just know that three meters reach six meters. How, how does that work? So there are other cells in the brain, which I had the slide there, I took it out, um, that did not win a Nobel Prize, but are related to answering exactly that question. So there are cells that respond to head position within a room. So basically the angle that the rat is looking at. And you can see why that would be useful even, even in the presence of a grid. But the, um, uh, there are boundary cells that respond. So there are some cells that would respond if I walked up this wall, they would respond all the way. So they're responding to the fact that I'm near a boundary. And all these cells are interdigitated. And again, once the... Um, Oh, and then there are motion cells that actually track exactly that, which is the how much am I walking, and it um, they're less well studied. At least I found less literature on them, uh, but they integrate with the place and grid cells and help and help, and I, I really can't tell you much more than that. I had a question about the spatial resolution um, with respect to the depth. Is it because the neurons that are deep have less weight, or is it related to the time it takes the signal to travel up? Well, they're certainly not because they're less weight. Uh, uh, it works, we think, even in, in uh, like marine mammals, which, for which weight is not a... But uh, no, actually, I mean the weighting you give to the signal is it moves from the oh, bottom oh, to the top. Oh, that right. weight. Um, <laughs> I thought you were thinking they were sort of sedimenting in the brain. Um, so it, it's not that. Um, no, it's the connections. Um, it's the connections. And as I say, it, it, it's not known to me. And I, I, I think, as I'd say, from just going through the literature, it probably isn't known. It's one of the challenges. What is the circuitry that underlies this? I mean, we now sort of understand this in the visual system, how synapse by synapse, the information comes from the retina to area 17, 18, and 19. We understand that really in some sort of systems level depth what, what, the, what the neurons are calculating. We don't actually know. I mean, just because, as I said, even understanding whether the place cells are what specify the grid or whether the grid specifies the place, there are models that go both ways. You, you can use grid to specify place since there are different grid uh, dimensions, but you can also use place to specify grid, and we just don't know. Um, and so the, what I would call tangential circuitry, from deep medial enterhinal to superficial medial, medial enterhinal. Not known. Not known. One last question. Yeah. Thank you for your uh, speech. Actually, I have two questions. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. uh, about uh, <coughs> the first one, 
when we're talking about uh, our location, we're actually talking about uh, where we are in a special uh, time point or time, uh, uh, time window. So I'm curious, uh, how does this uh, circuit uh, uh, recruit uh, time, uh, time information? Is there any downstream uh, neurons who will fire for the uh, gray cell or gray cells? Uh, I, I don't know, and I didn't find anything, but it's an excellent question because timing obviously uh, is, time is a dimension that's critical to really finding your way in space because you need to know how long to walk in one way. Uh, and you're, again, with the lights out, that, that's the only way you would know. I think somebody are uh, focusing on some neurons in hippocampus also called time neurons. Is there any correlation between this one and this? There would be. I didn't run across them, so uh, I'll go. That's that'll be my job for next weekend. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, second question is about uh, uh, when we are talking about spatial memory, it is actually actually different from other memories. So, yes. uh, as you know, uh, as you uh, mentioned, that uh, uh, hippocampus are coding for both uh, spatial information and uh, memory. So how can we distinguish these two functions? Uh, uh, as for, let, let's say, uh, fair condition, uh, conditional fair condition, this 100% uh, uh, they need uh, hippocampus. But for ordinary uh, uh, fair, fair memory, the, the hippocampus seems to all, only uh, offer it as a memory. But we cannot exclude the spatial information also in uh, this, uh, this kind of task. How, how can we distinguish these two functions? So that is a really excellent question, and I have to say that the longer I spent with the, with the literature, the more that question bothered me. And it was, no, and, and the reason is I work on Alzheimer's disease, and I, spatial memory is a component of the disease, but it's, by most people's reckoning, it's a minor component of the disease, and yet, we're wiping out the whole structure that is carrying our spatial memory. So I don't know the answer. I would, it, it astonished me that so many, I thought, you know, a place cell here, a place cell there, maybe they're 5% of the hippocampus, but it's 90% of the cells of the hippocampus. The other thing which is relevant is that there was an entire book written, and I think it was certainly after 1971, but I don't, I know the guy, and I don't think he knew of, of O'Keefe's work, but he wrote a book on memory aids, which says, if you really want to remember something, imagine yourself in a house and put one of your memories on a chair and tell yourself that that's where, you know, six plus three is nine, but you put that, you put that fact on a chair, and then if you want to remember, you just remember that that fact is on the chair and, and, and so, yeah, yeah, yeah. of course, it fits very well with exactly the inner interspersion of, of the place cells and what we call memory. So, is it possible that our hippocampus is only coding for the spatial information? What called memory actually occurs between the hippocampus and other brain regions? So, the memory located in the network, not only hippocampus, because we cannot get rid of the spatial information all the times. So, it seems that hippocampus is overweighted this system. So I would say, so I have thought about this, and this now we're getting to where this is a little irresponsible, so stop listening. Um, if you think about the evolution, it, it doesn't matter to a chicken how much six plus three is. That's an irrelevant concept. It doesn't matter, you know, how to differentiate an equation. That's an irrelevant concept to a chicken. But a chicken and a bird and a frog care about where they are in the environment. So the question, I think, is how did we evolve the other memories, the ability to store other types of memory out of a system that was designed to tell us about space? And that, I think, is the fundamental biological question. Thank you. Yeah. OK. So, so we go back and respectfully, uh, what will be the next uh, Nobel, Nobel Prize, Prize in Neuroscience? Which topic? Oh, God. Which area? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I don't know, regulation of cell cycle in the, co in the coordination of cell death. Okay, that'd be enough for another one. Okay, lecture on the Nobel Prize. Thank you.